Good morning and welcome to St. John's by the Sea service of morning prayer for Sunday, July 19th, 2020. Before we begin, I want to say thank you for all those who have been praying for my family during this time. My mother passed last Friday the 10th and we had our services yesterday the 16th. I've been greatly encouraged by the many comments of encouragement to our family during this time. And now as we look this Sunday at our scripture lessons, we are going to see a picture of how the world pursues happiness as opposed to how God has told us to pursue happiness. The world tries at whatever the cost to make themselves, to make yourself the best you possible by looking deep inside of you and looking outside to those around you for affirmation and encouragement. But the scriptures very clearly teach us that what is inside of us cannot save us. And that those around us who are looking for encouragement can be just as broken as we are. And how much we are in need of God's transformative work in our lives and not our own. Let us now prepare our hearts for worship. says the High and Lofty One, who inhabits eternity, whose name is Holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, with him who has a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the hearts of the contrite ones. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God, saying, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. 
we have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which he ought to have done, and we have done those things which he ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But you, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent, according to your promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desires not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, has given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardons and absolves all those who truly repent and genuinely believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beg him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The first lesson is taken from the second chapter of Ecclesiastes, beginning at the first verse. I said in my heart, Come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad and of pleasure. What use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me, and whatever my eyes desired I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. For my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity, and a striving after the wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. I hated all my toil, in which I toil under the sun seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me, and who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who was toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
The second lesson is taken from St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, beginning at the first verse. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep, and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both nets, so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of the fish that they had taken, and also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid, from now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us now recite our profession of faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. 
Amen. Amen. Known as the pursuit of happiness. We can take encouragement from Solomon, who sought to have joy in every possible way that the world could offer joy and found he could not find it. So often we're seeking after what the world says we should be seeking after, and we just don't think we can get enough of it. Solomon got plenty and realized not wealth, not lust, not power, that nothing in this world could bring him true joy. On the other hand, the disciples had jobs which they enjoyed, which they gave up the moment that Jesus called them to be his disciples, to seek after him, to enjoy God, and to glorify him. Let us worship, pray now. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The past two Sunday mornings that I have had the opportunity to preach have covered some rather heavy topics. Two weeks ago, we saw our scripture lessons focus on St. Peter's discussion on the role of humility in the life of a Christian. He laid out how we are to humble ourselves before others, lifting them up, caring for the needs of others just as much as we care for the needs of ourselves, and valuing others as we value ourselves. We looked at pride and false humility. We also looked at what it is to be humble before God, to realize who God is in relation to us and to seek to act accordingly. The good news hopefully you took out of that message is when we humble ourselves before others and especially when we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, he will lift us up. Last week, we looked at the topic of national sin. My illustration for that Sunday, two weeks ago, you hopefully remembered, was comparing Habakkuk's plea before God for his nation and the Lord answering him in pretty much the exact opposite way he wished. Habakkuk had looked over the nation which he loved and had seen it fall away so far from where it used to be, a feeling we can probably all associate with, and he prayed that God would do something about his people who had lost their way, hoping that God would raise up a new Josiah to bring the nation back to the truth. But God responded by telling Habakkuk, no, that is not the way it will go. In fact, I am going to bring judgment on the people of God as a means to restore them. It also relates very well to today, where we have a lot of national sin in the form of promoting abortion, promoting lust, promoting perversions, which have all seen our nation fall prey to now looking out and seeing evil just rampaging through the land in the form of radical Marxists. But in all these things, God can lift us up above all of them. And if God chooses to judge us, then that is God's choice. I have good news, though, this morning, and that we have an obviously much more pleasant topic to look at. We look at what it is to seek true joy, or what is commonly called in our nation the pursuit of happiness. And while it is certainly a much more pleasant topic to think about rather than national judgment, 
it is just as important as these other discussions. In fact, the whole idea of why we need to humble ourselves, why there are times that we suffer in this life is based on the fact that finding true joy is not truly defined as indulging in as much pleasure as we possibly could. It's not defined by our prosperity. It's not defined by the esteem that we are held in by others. But true joy is found simply by living as our Creator made us to live, rather than how the fallen nature around us has pushed us to live. God made us to enjoy Him, and yet sin entices us away from true pleasure, and it entices us really, when you think about it, into nothing. Not simply false pleasure, but nothing. Our lesson this morning encourages us to find our true joy in this life by following God. In our collects of the day, we have actually two collects which pray a petition of peace in the world, both emphasizing in their prayers so that the church can fulfill its work to joyfully serve, glorify God. Peace is not just so we can sit around and not be bothered, but it's so that we can do our work. And when you read through the collect of the day for today, which has been prayed for by Christians for over 1,400 years in the church, not English, obviously, it was Latin first, but you can see how this particular prayer was used as a model for the language and the focus of the Westminster, Westminster Shorter Catechism, which tells us that our chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. When you look at the negative perspective, looking at it from the world's view, Solomon confesses in the lesson from Ecclesiastes his working for happiness constantly along worldly lines and the futility of trying to find happiness that way. Solomon had acquired great power, great esteem in the eyes of others, great wealth. He indulged in any lustful pursuit that he desired, and in the end he knew all of this is worthless. In Ecclesiastes 2.11, he says, Then I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil I had extended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity and striving after the wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. In our gospel, Peter models finding joy for us as he models the joy of what it is to be called by God and to follow God's word. The question, of course, is, is obedience really joy? It seems like it's work. But obedience to God and the work which he has for us shows us how to find true joy. Our problem is that we are so often told that true joy, the kind of joy which God gives when we live as he intended, is something in the world's eyes which seems meaningless or just actually not fun. In the same way Solomon said that finding joy in the world is meaningless and ultimately not fun. It's so easy to become discouraged and honestly we would not be human if we didn't from time to time get discouraged so we need to remember the words and the events recorded in today's New Testament lesson from Luke chapter 5 so let's review and see how this calling of the disciples 
gives us a picture of true lasting joy. Because the crowd was pressing around Jesus as he was on the beach, Christ got into Simon Peter's boat. He had Peter push out a few feet from the shore and he sat down in the boat and taught the giant crowd that followed him from the sea. Then after he was done preaching, Jesus gave this fateful command to Simon Peter. Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Peter answered that they had worked all the previous night without catching anything. But showing obedience and faith to Jesus, Peter said, Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Then we see a huge catch resulted. And he and Andrew had to actually call their partners in to help them. Obviously, James and John among the partners. There are a few passages in the scripture that are so full of what should be encouragement for the workers of Christ in the church. Through obedience to what Christ said to him and in perseverance in his work, Peter was able to obtain results that he never would have gotten if he ignored Christ's command. Because Peter listened and followed the Lord humbly, obviously Peter knows how to fish, Jesus is a carpenter, not a fisherman. But Peter humbled himself, obeyed the Lord, and he immediately knew that someone more than ordinary had given this command to him. As yet, Peter simply knew him to be a good teacher. Sensing his own unworthiness, Peter bows down in front of Jesus. And he says that he is not worthy to be in Jesus' presence. He has no thought for this great catch of fish, which is worth so much for him. And Jesus looked to him and told him, do not be afraid. From now on, he would be catching men for the kingdom of heaven rather than catching fish. Where the... Encouraging phrase, follow me and I will make you fishers of men, comes from. When Peter and the others got back to shore, Andrew, James, and John, the four of them gave up their business. And they followed Jesus from that moment on to build something wonderful and lasting, something which is here today with us, the Church of God. They left everything to follow him. This was the response that Peter, Andrew, James, and John had to this miraculous showing of Christ's power in this catch of fish and the Lord's declaration not to be afraid and the Lord's declaration that they would be working for his kingdom from now on to bring the gospel to men. In comparing this with Solomon's writing in Ecclesiastes, we see several positive things about what it is to be a disciple of Jesus. It tells us that discipleship starts with obedience, the willing acceptance of what our Lord has asked of us, and trusting his word above all all of our earthly desires. Peter said when Jesus, the carpenter, was telling Peter the fisherman how to fish, his response was, at your word, I will let down the net. Peter knew, of course, how to fish. He knew when to fish. But he didn't wait for a better time, such as the nighttime, when it was best to fish on the Sea of Galilee. He didn't debate the issues of how to plan out 
best the best way to follow Jesus command and I bring this out because any of us who have worked with others whether in the church or whether in our daily jobs can probably come up off the top of our heads with a number of stories on how often more time is spent discussing or arguing about the best way to do something or when is the best time to do something than actually doing something. In life, if we wait for a perfect set of circumstances for what we think needs to be done, we would never begin at all. Peter was obedient then and there to the Lord's command. We are to do what comes to hand to be done as unto the Lord, Paul wrote to the Colossians. And whatever you do in word and deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That's Colossians 3:17. Another great verse which I memorized as a young man, 1 Corinthians 10:31. So whether you eat or you drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. When we work in the name of the Lord, when we frame everything as if serving God is what brings us true joy, which is true, it frames our spiritual life for us. The writer of Ecclesiastes said that there were times when he found a good deal of pleasure in the striving, the working hard for a goal and achieving that goal. There, there truly is in this world a satisfaction for a job well done. And then he looks back and he says in his next comments, he just says, all of it is useless, vanity. He pushes it all aside and he says in the end of his life, it really did amount to nothing. In verse 11 of chapter 2, he expresses in some of the gloomiest words you'll find in the scriptures. Then I considered all that my hands had done, all the hard work that I had spent doing it. And I realized that it was all useless vanity. It was all striving to catch the wind. In verse 18 and 19 of chapter 2, Solomon expresses his frustration about how he worked so hard for all the things he amassed in this world. Great wealth, great power is a great nation for Israel. And how he would leave it all to his son and how he was afraid Rehoboam his son was a complete fool and would absolutely be disastrous in terms of his use of all that Solomon had acquired and of course he was absolutely correct as Rehoboam lost most of the kingdom of Israel shortly after becoming the king Ten of the tribes rejected him. When we do everything in the name of the Lord, when we lay up our treasures in heaven, we actually find that we can make our labor lasting. When we do it to the Lord for his eternal kingdom, a kingdom which does not pass away, it makes working and living have a sense of purpose in life that only the gospel of Christ can impart. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. There's a second aspect of discipleship in Luke's statement. They forsook all and followed him. The claim of Jesus on his disciples is a total claim. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. 
and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Some Christians are called, like these four disciples, in the service of the Lord, to forsake everything, to leave family behind, to leave worldly possessions behind, as Peter was called. None of us will probably be called in that way. But all Christians are called to forsake worldly motives, greed, envy, lust, vainglory, and hatred. And we are to leave them behind in following Christ. This is necessary not just for some, but for all followers of Christ. He is our Lord, and the Lordship of Christ means we are to give a complete dedication to Him. Now, differing degrees of renunciation of what the world has to offer us, of course. He has very few to renounce family and all their possessions, to sell all and follow Him. But He does call us all to keep the right perspective in place of material things. Not necessarily to sell them all, but to use them productively for his kingdom. And of other rewards which this world has to offer to put them into place. Because we need to put him first in place. If there comes a choice in our lives between him and our families, friends, possessions, and status in the eyes of the world. On a later occasion, our Lord said to the twelve, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever will save his life will lose it. But whoever will lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it from mark 8 34 to 35 this really is a message that is very badly needed by our self-indulgent age in which we live by those who say they are seeking self-fulfillment who are trying to find themselves because there is no good thing in us without christ Self-fulfillment comes when we stop trying to put ourselves at the center of our little universe and joyfully give ourselves to the service of the Lord as his disciples. We can find ourselves when we lose ourselves in the service of God and his kingdom. And when we keep before us the spirit and attitude shown by those who forsook all and followed him let us pray lord help us when our hearts seek after the joys of this world to turn back to embrace you as our lord and to seek first your kingdom help us lord to find our true joy not in meaningless things but in you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, Amen.
Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, we beg you, that the course of this world may be so peaceably ordered by your governance that your church may joyfully serve you in all godly quietness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O eternal God, our Heavenly Father, who alone makes men to be of one mind in a house and stills the outrage of a violent and unruly people, we bless your holy name and ask that it would please you to appease the seditious tumults which have been lately raised up amongst us, most humbly begging you to grant us grace that we may obediently walk in your holy commandments, lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, and continually offer unto you our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving for these your mercies toward us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O most mighty and merciful God, to whom alone belong the issues of life and death, in this time of grievous sickness we flee unto you for relief. Deliver us, we beg you, from our peril. Give strength and skill to your ministers of healing. Bless the means of cure, and grant that, perceiving how frail is our earthly life, we may apply our hearts unto that heavenly wisdom which leads to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, the high and mighty ruler of the universe, who does from your throne behold all the dwellers upon earth, most heartily we beg you with your favor to behold and bless your servant, Donald Trump, our president, our Senate and representatives in Congress assembled. Philip Murphy, the governor of New Jersey, Tom Wolf, the governor of Pennsylvania, and all others in authority. And so replenish them with the grace of your Holy Spirit, that they may always incline to your will and walk in your way. Empower them plenteously with heavenly gifts. Grant them in health and prosperity long to live. And finally, after this life, to attain everlasting joy and happiness, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, the strong tower and refuge of your people, we entreat your favor upon the officers and all who are enlisted in the service of defense of our country. Ever spare them from being ordered into a war of aggression or oppression. Use them, if need be, as your instruments in the defense of our national life and liberty. By restraining, we beg you, the greed and wrath of man, that wars may cease in all the earth. Watch over also all policemen and law enforcement officers everywhere, especially Tim Richfalski. Protect them from harm in the performance of their duty. We pray also for firefighters, first responders, and health care workers who protect us and ours from all types of danger. Give these men and women the courage and skills to carry out their duties well and safely, when they must go into the face of danger, be by their side. Watch over their families, reminding them that those who go into danger are in your loving care. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, from whom comes every good and perfect gift, send down upon our bishops, especially Foley, Ray, and Chuck, and other clergy, and upon the congregations committed to their charge, the healthful spirit of your grace, that they may truly please you, pour upon them the continual dew of your blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our Advocate and Mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. O God, the Creator and Preserver of all mankind, we humbly beg you for all sorts and conditions of men, that you would be pleased to make your ways known unto them, your saving health unto all nations. More especially, we pray for your Holy Church universal, that it may be so guided and governed by your good spirit, that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth, and hold the faith and unity of spirit, in the bond of peace, and in righteousness of life. Finally, we commend to your fatherly goodness all those who are in any ways afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or estate, 
especially those for whom our prayers are desired. We lift up to you, Lord, the Blitz family with Linda's home going last Friday. We pray for Willie Miley and his recovery now at home. For our friends and family who own businesses that have been greatly affected by the virus. So we pray especially, Lord, for Heather and Al, for Larry, for Mark, for Roy and Bill, for Rachel Rosenberg, Dominic, Heather and Grace, Ariel and Oliver, Noah, Jonathan, Brian, Sydney and Nick in their continued job search. We pray, Lord, for all those who have been so greatly affected by the coronavirus, especially for Marie Young West, for Emily and Rob Marble, and we thank you, Lord, for their recovery, as we thank you for the recovery of Pastor Bill and Kim Jenkins. We lift before you, Lord, Jean, Ted, and Midge, for Audrey Cox, who likely now has Lyme disease, for Father Ted Rothrock. We pray, Lord, for the upcoming youth camp that will be held in Pennsylvania up beyond Scranton next week. We pray, Lord, that you will watch over it, keep all those in attendance safe and especially virus-free. We pray, Lord, for those who will be speaking that they will be given your words to encourage and build up those in attendance. Hear our prayer, O Lord, that it may please you to comfort and relieve them according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their sufferings and a happy issue out of all their afflictions. And this we beg for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give humble and hearty thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that our hearts may be truly thankful, and that we may declare your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Almighty God, you have promised to hear the petitions of those who ask in your Son's name. Mercifully accept us who have now made our prayers and petitions to you, and grant us those things which we have asked in faith, according to your will, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, Christ and the love of God, and, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen.
As we consider usually at this time, I would remind you to support your local parish. Um, when possible, you can do that now by going to church. St. John's Church is now open for 8.30 and 10 o'clock services every Sunday, and you are welcome to attend. We do have certain restrictions up for the safety of everyone, including wearing a mask and keeping social distance. And we have the church interior set up to assist with that. But we certainly would welcome you to come and attend. If you are not able to attend and would like to support our ministry anyway, you may check out below our link to our church website, which has information on how you can support it. Or of course, as always, you can write a check and mail it to the church. Also, while you're checking out below, please, if you are not subscribed already, please subscribe to St. John's by the Sea and click on the bell icon after you subscribe. Also, feel free to like the videos. That's always a nice thing, and it helps the videos to get promoted through YouTube. Thank you for visiting St. John's by the Church. Did you get that one? Yeah. Thank you for Within St. John by the Church. This is this is no one called Thank what's that called? Thank you for visiting St. John by the Church. This is Carter and not Noah. Only Carter. <laughs> this is Carter and Noah. Thank you for visiting St. John. Hi. Thank you for visiting St. John's Bye, Jean.